in your life until now. Amen. Okay, let's turn to the Word of God this morning. And uh, as you can see, do you have some idea of what we're going to talk about this morning? Um, a whole, whole bunch of money. I, I got this from Google Images. I can't remember where this hoard of treasure is from, but I believe it's, it was found somewhere in the UK. Anyhow, one of the treasure hoards of the UK. Uh, maybe it is Anglo-Saxon gold or something like that. I'm not quite sure. Or Roman gold. Not completely sure about that. But I want to ask you something this morning as we, as we turn to the Word of God. Uh, how many of you uh, have ever found treasure before or you found something valuable? Kind of out of the blue. You, yes? Oh, I see several people. So I'm really curious now. Okay. Uh, 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 so Keith has found something, Moses has found something, Ida has found something, and she still has it. I know what it is. Is it a secret? Yeah. Oh, it's, I'm so sorry. It's a secret. You go ask her what, you, you, go, ask, you go ask her what it is, but it, she found it on the streets of Hong Kong. <laughs> you would think there are no treasures on the streets of Hong Kong, but there are sometimes. Keith, had, Keith has found something before. Anybody else found anything? Okay, maybe you didn't find a pile of gold. Uh, but did you find something else that was kind of valuable? Anyone? Yeah? What did you find, Keith? Uh, well, you've got to bear in mind that the time I was about 11 or 12. So five dollars is a treasure when you're 11 or 12, right? And, uh, my pocket money <clears throat> I had to earn. Uh, so, okay, so I'm, 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 I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to repeat after you because of this. So Keith said uh, his po he had to earn his pocket money, so he's only 11 or 12, okay? Uh, 10 pence was his pocket money. <laughs> and he found 10 pounds. <laughs> and he felt he was rich. <laughs> he felt he was rich. So, <laughs> so and, and that sort of fits into what we're talking about because um, depending on our situation, the things, that, things that, are, that we think are valuable, it will depend on our situation, right, at the time. So uh, Moses has found, Moses, you waved your hand, right? What did you find, Moses? 3,000 pesos. 3, pesos in the Philippines. <laughs> okay, now, though, you, you jaded, cynical Hong Kongers, <laughs> you say 3,000 pesos, but in the Philippines, 3,000 pesos, when you find it, that's not a small amount, right? It's not, it's not a small amount. So, uh, so I, I have found treasure before, too, but I'll, I'll, I'll let you know about that a little bit later. Uh, so I want to... Um, uh, I want to, uh, I, I could have done much more, but if I, if I share too much on this part, I'm afraid it will uh, awaken greed in our hearts. So let me just share, let me just share a few treasure discoveries, and then we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about treasure and precious things. Uh, I'm going to be beginning a series today for the next few weeks that I, I trust will be a blessing to you. So let me tell you one, um, I chose a few different places. This is from the UK. And it was discovered in 2009, uh, and there was a, 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 a guy, a man, who was an amateur hobbyist of, he, had a, he was in, belonged to a medical, a metal detecting club, you know, had a, he had a metal detector. And he was out in a field, and he discovered a hoard of uh, mostly gold coins, gold and silver and garnets. Um, and uh, he, and so he, and then the farmer, the farmer, the owner of the field, they began looking together. And this one is called the Staffordshire Hoard. Some of you may be familiar with it. So from 2009, and uh, the riches are, so I know some of you are Googling right now because you're really interested in it. I believe there is a, a, a bigger one that has been found recently, but this seems to be the most famous one still. So discovered in 2009, it was Anglo-Saxon. So those of you who have studied in school recently or whatever, you may go, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Those of us who are a little bit older, we may not remember so well. So anyhow, uh, in, pardon me, I'm American, so I'm using US dollar amounts, okay? Not in pounds or Hong Kong dollars or whatever. So uh, it was about, it was 5.1 kg of gold, um, about, three plus pounds, a uh, three plus kg of silver, and then all of the, uh, uh, the things that went with it were, uh, the, all the precious, semi-precious stones were garnet, 
which is not ruby, but you know, it's a, a, a lower price, but still very beautiful. And this one was especially interesting because there were uh, no, uh, there were no women, pieces of women's jewelry in it, which was kind of interesting. Um, and apparently there were no coins in it either. It was sort of a, it seemed to be a military treasure. Uh, so that's the Staffordshire, a, a, and the garnet artifacts, these, there were over 3,500 of them and he just happened to find it in the field. So there's a treasure indeed, value around four million. Okay, so around four million US. Uh, so then I found one, there's one in the US as well, uh, and it's called the Saddle Ridge Hoard, and this was found in 2013. A couple named John and Mary were, they lived out in California. Interestingly, they are in the area where there was the gold rush in the 1800s. And on their property, uh, th uh, they were hiking, and they were walking their dog, and they were walking along a path that they had walked many times before, and they happened to notice uh, a very rusted can, kind of the wife noticed, kind of sticking out of the ground a little bit. And so she thought, well, that's interesting. And so they tried to pull it up, couldn't pull it up, got a stick and pull, 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 and finally pulled it out of the ground. And it was so heavy that they thought it has lead paint in it. So they took it home, and on the way home, the, the rusty can cracked open, and it was full of gold coins. And that is called the Saddle Ridge Hoard. That's the name of it, and its value was, this is where they, this was the, the in the ground, the discovery, and then in total they found about eight cans of gold coins uh, worth about 10 million, here, here it is in the original gold can. So, and, and this was on a path they had walked, hiked many, many times before. Um, and the coins seemed to be not just like in use, but they were like tr uh, uh, saved coins. Like they were in perfect condition. So they thought, was this a bank robbery? They don't know. Um, so there's, they don't know where it came from. But one coin was in such perfect value that by itself was valued one coin at one million US dollars, just the one coin itself because of the perfect condition and so on. Uh, by the way, if you've got a whole bunch of money sitting in your pocket or uh, in the bank, you may go to Amazon where this couple sells some of the, the gold coins uh, on Amazon. You can look for Saddle Ridge Hoard. Uh, who are these people? We don't know. They have chosen to remain anonymous because they don't want treasure hunters coming on their property. But we know their names are John and Mary, so that's, so, uh, that's what we know. So that was about 10 million, so you can see it, it's getting higher and higher, right? And then there was one more that I think today is the greatest treasure uh, hoard discovered, and this was a shipwreck. And actually, shipwrecks tend to be of more value because of, because of the amount that's on it. And this was uh, from a, it was called the San Jose Galleon, which is a Spanish ship, uh, shipwreck. It was sunk 300 years ago near the coast of Colombia. It was a ship that was the flagship, a treasure ship of the Spanish fleet, of the Spanish Navy, and they were sailing from Panama further, maybe to Mexico, I'm not sure, and the, the Spanish fleet ran into the British fleet. <laughs> the, I'll bet John knows this one. And in the battle, pow, this San Jose, the ship, it had uh, all of its, uh, 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 the, what's it called, the armory, where all of the, the, the gunpowder and all of that, it got hit. The magazine got hit, and pow, the whole thing went down. Uh, before the British could salvage all the treasure. So, that one's called the San Jose Shipwreck, and it was discovered in 2015. How about that? Now, you all want to know, right? It was discovered in 2015, and they are still keeping the location secret. And most of the treasure is still underwater. Uh, it's in 950 meters of water. So it's way down there, but here's some of the treasure. There's the shipwreck itself, and they've begun to take more pictures. So here, uh, a lot of gold. Here, here's what I found kind of interesting. They found a complete Chinese tea set that, had, that was on, on board and made it all the way down, completely unbroken, apparently. That was part of it. Of course, cannons and things, and things like that. So as far as they know, uh, this has only been estimated by historians. They don't know because most of the treasure is still down there. Uh, 
950 meters down. So here's some of the treasures. Okay. Uh, so I was looking in the Philippines, and I was going to share something from the Philippines, because many of you are from the Philippines, but I thought it was a little more in interesting to talk about the rumor of Japanese gold in the Philippines. So you all are laughing. It's called Yamashita's treasure, right? Or Yamashita's gold. And apparently, uh, the Japanese Imperial Army, according to rumor, looted gold from around Southeast Asia, took it to the Philippines, and it is buried in tunnels and caves around various Filipino cities. Billions and billions and billions, billions and billions. Have you heard of this before? We've all heard of this before. Unfortunately, not a single gold coin has ever been found. <laughs> so there are questions as to this rumor or not. Um, so, uh, so I told you I have found something before. I have found treasure before. Uh, two weeks ago, ah, two weeks ago, I was cleaning out my office, the paperwork, on a Monday, on my day off, and I thought, oh, all this junk, it's been on my desktop for two years, for, I thought, let me throw this paper away. And I was just recklessly throwing paper and envelopes away, recklessly. And there was a little envelope there, and I was starting to throw away, and I thought, I better check it, just in case. And I opened it up, and inside was 2,600 Hong Kong dollars <laughs> that had been there for four years. <laughs> four years, I almost threw it away, but I found it, it was somebody that had borrowed some, and they were giving it back, and they put it in the envelope along with the note, oh, thanks for whatever, and it was there, and I'd forgotten about it, so I discovered treasure as well. So all of us at various times said, oh, yeah, I have treasure, um, and uh, so what I want to talk about uh, today, so that's just our intro, right? That's just, to get the, that's just to get our juices flowing, if you will. I didn't want to give you more, because then we'd start getting greedy, right? In fact, how many of you got a little bit greedy when you heard about that 22 billion? You thought, mm -hmm. <laughs> me too. Uh, by the way, the Colombian government has claimed to that. Uh, and according to international law, it is theirs. So they will, they will salvage it at some point. But I want to, for the next few weeks, uh, uh, that, was, that was a lighthearted start. But I do want to talk about something much more serious. And I want to talk uh, for the next few weeks about precious things, OK? about precious things. So you already know that I'm not going to talk about gold and silver, right? Uh, because we're going to talk about precious things according to what God says precious things are. And uh, God says these things. We've looked at these things. And, and honestly, we'd all love to find precious things. We'd all love to find treasure. And what God says is, I want you, I want us to see that other things are precious. And we know this. But um, I, I believe the Lord has, has this for us. Uh, it, it, just a, a different way. We've been talking about trouble and help. This is very different from that. So I hope you have your Bibles. And uh, uh, we'll be looking at most of the scriptures here. And we'll be looking mostly at the New Testament, okay? Because uh, uh, there's a lot in the Old Testament, but we're going to focus primarily on the New Testament. And uh, in the New Testament, how many writers of the New Testament are there? There are 15 or 16 writers in the New Testament, okay? So 15 or 16. Why 15 or 16? Because some people can't agree. Was Hebrews written by Paul or was it written by someone else? We don't know. So it's either 15 or 16. So as we talk about this word, uh, precious, this is the word we're going to focus on. Um, of the 15 or 16 writers in the New Testament, guess what? Only four, only four out of 15 or 16 use the word precious. And I know they're different types of uh, translations, but the word that is translated precious, only four use this word precious to describe things of great value, and most of those are used to describe tangible things of great value. John, uh, in, uh, so John wrote the Gospel of John, and then 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and then the book of Revelation. So John, uh, had, wrote five books, 51 chapters, and he uses the word precious, the, the word Greek word that is translated precious, but only in the book of Revelation, and he's talking about gold and silver and precious stones, literal gold and silver and precious stones. And then there's Paul, 13 books, 87 chapters, and he only uses the word one time, one time. 
um, and it's intangible. James, the brother of Jesus, uses the word one time, and it's to talk about the precious harvest that comes up. So there's one other writer in the New Testament. He didn't write a lot, but in using the word precious, this writer uses the word six to nine times, dep depending on how it's counted. Six to nine times. Who do you think it might be? And in one, and in one of his letters, he uses it seven times. Seven times. Who do you think it might be? Peter. Exactly. It's Peter. So our focus will be the writer Peter, and we're going to see what he says about precious things. Uh, there are a lot of ways to study the Bible. You can do a study like begin at the beginning, beginning of a book, go to the end. Uh, you can do a word study. You can do a, a topic study, a lot of things like that. We're going to do kind of a, a topic slash word study. And so we're going to look at 1 Peter, mostly 1 Peter 5. And, um, and we're not going to dig into all the Greek here. But if you'll turn to 1 Peter, okay, 1 Peter We'll begin, uh, 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 we'll look at 2 Peter a little bit later, but if you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Peter. And as we look at this word precious, uh, Peter uses the word precious in, uh, he uses five different Greek words that are translated precious every time, which I think is kind of interesting, right? So there's something going on here. Remember when we study the Bible, if God repeats himself, it's not because he's forgetful, as we are. My mom, she's elderly now, right? And she'll st start to tell the story, and she'll say, have I told you this story before? And, of course, she has. Um, and I'll say, yeah, but that's okay. Um, tell me again, anyhow. Uh, Dad, before he passed away, especially after the stroke, was very repetitive, and he would, he would tell a story, or he'd, he'd, tell, he'd say something, and then literally two minutes later, he'd tell the same thing again. But... You know, what are, you're not going to scold. You're not going to say, yeah, Dad, you've told that. You just listen and you enjoy it. But God's not like that. He's got a perfect mind, right? And so uh, he's, he's doing something when in one book with one writer, there's one person who is inspired to talk about precious things so many times with so many different words. So the meaning is for precious in the Greek uh, is extremely, these five words, extremely valuable, extremely expensive, costly, of great price, honored, esteemed, esteemed to the highest degree, and beloved. Okay? So that's the range of words there as, wh as well. Um, and so that's what we're going to look at. And today, what we're going to look at is precious stones precious stones. That will be our, our focus today, and then we will look at some other things as well. So Peter, and why are we going to start here? Peter talks about stones. Guess how many times? How many times do you think he uses the word stone in 1 Peter? Nine times. Nine times. And so something's going on here, so let's look at it together. Um, and we're going to begin with chapter 2. So look with me, 1 Peter 2. We're going to look at verses 4 through 7. Let's look at this together. Peter writes to many Christians, to, including us, as you come to him, who's him? Who's him? Jesus. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For the scripture says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now, to you who believe, this stone is precious. So we're going to talk about precious stones. We're going to start by talking about Jesus, who is our precious stone. Um, have you ever thought about why 
God the Holy Spirit gave different writing assignments to various writers. Those of you who are students presently or who are teachers presently, when you're in class and you give a writing assignment or you receive a writing assignment, you all get the same writing assignment, right? In the class, everybody writes the same paper, right? Here's the subject, write about this. Or if you're uh, a teacher, you give the same writing assignment, right? But look at it. Uh, Stella's laughing, because I know she does. Here's this beautiful book that God has inspired. God the Holy Spirit has inspired. And in this book, he gave everyone, all of these writers, different writing assignments. Have you thought about that before? Different writing assignments. So my question to you this morning is this. Why? Why? Why did Peter get the writing assignment about precious things? Not only that, why did Peter get the writing assignment precious stones? Because he did, right? Does anybody else write about precious stones? Only Isaiah, one time in the Old Testament, and <laughs> only one time in the Old Testament, and Peter quotes Isaiah. So why does Peter get it? And this will mean, I, why does he get this assignment? He could have inspired anyone to write about Jesus, the living stone, the chosen stone, the precious stone, the cornerstone. I think it's because early in his ministry, Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter, went and he found Simon, his brother, the fisherman. And he said, Simon, Simon, I found the Messiah. And Andrew brings his brother, Simon, to meet Jesus. And Simon walks up, Simon, son of John, that was his name. He walks up to Jesus and Jesus looks at him. Do you remember what Jesus said to Simon? Jesus looked at Simon and said, Simon, your, he said, your name is Simon son of John, but you will be called Cephas, which means what? Peter, which means what? Stone, stone. Jesus looked at him and said, yeah, you're, you're Simon, but you will be called a stone, a stone. And I was thinking about that as I, I, I look at, at this writing, and I was thinking about how we are called as well. Now you say, oh yeah, yeah, my name is Jennifer, it means this. Or I am, I am uh, Andrew, and this is what it means. Or I am uh, Myrna, and this is what it means. We are named, but I want to talk about it uh, figuratively or symbolically. The world looks at us, the world looks at you and labels you, does it not? The world labels you according to, or, or names you according to your color, according to your achievements, according to your ability, according to your wealth, according to your education, according to your job, according to all of these things. And the world names us and labels us. But our God looks at us and with his perfect wisdom, perfect love looks at us and says, yes, you are called this, but you will be called this. Every one of us, God looks beyond what we are now. God looks beyond who we are now. God looks beyond what we do, where we're from, how much money we have, all of these things. And God with his eyes, of, of, you know what I mean, God with his eyes, God with his love, God with his power, God with his grace and mercy for you and me looks at you as you are now and looks ahead at what you and I can be through him. And he says, you may be this now, but you will be this. You will be this. God has something for you your identity, your calling, your work, your, 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 who you are that is greater than you are now. Some of you feel limited this morning. Some of you feel trapped this morning. Some of you feel, I will always be this. But you will not be that way in God. 
let God look at you. Let God speak to you and say, yes, you are this now, but you will be. You will be this. If I were Peter, at some point in my life, or if I were one of the disciples, I would look and I would say, Jesus, you made a mistake with that one. Have you ever thought God made a mistake with you? Have you ever thought you've blown it? You know, you thought, oh, yes, God. And then you think, I've blown it. It's too bad. Look at Peter. Loud mouth, proud, boastful, bossy. How many of you dislike bossy people? And sometimes we're bossy too, aren't we? That's exactly what, what Peter was. God, you made a mistake with that one. Not only that, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, here was Peter, who was the rock. Peter, who was the stone. And what does he do? A little servant girl says, aren't you? And he says, no, 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 no. And he denies Jesus. But Jesus says to Peter, Peter, when you are restored, when you are converted, strengthen your brothers. That's what a rock does. That's what a stone does. And here's Peter, 30 years later. This was written about 30 years after the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And what is he doing? He's doing exactly what Jesus called him to do. When you're restored, strengthen your brothers. Anyhow, that's why I think, first, that's why I think Peter got this writing assignment about stones. I really do. Don't you think so? That's what I think. So I want to ask you something. And so the Holy Spirit tells Peter, write about this precious, living, chosen cornerstone, Jesus. So I want to ask you a question this morning. Um, what makes this stone, what makes this what makes something valuable? Let me ask you more generally first. What, what makes things valuable? When I was preparing for this yesterday, I was looking up different things. I was thinking about something that happened uh, early this year when I was in the Philippines. Uh, you know, I gathered with the pastors in the Philippines uh, and just for the time of refreshing. In the morning that we were leaving, uh, and when I travel in the Philippines, I always take hangers with me for my clothes because I can never find hangers anywhere. So I take hangers, and I take thin ones, cheap ones with me, like, you know, the white, hang, the white hangers that you get from the uh, dry cleaners or whatever. Now, and I know dry cleaners is expensive, but so I had a bunch of white hangers, uh, uh, metal hangers, wire hangers, from my father, from dad. How many years ago? 20 plus years ago when he was here in Hong Kong. And I always take him to, to the Philippines. I have a lot of them. So the last morning we were leaving, I was with the pastors and my suitcase was packed full. And I thought, oh, I don't have room for this. I've got more at home. And so I pulled out the hangers to all the pastors. And I said, hey, I've got a bunch of hangers. Who would like them? And they looked at me. <laughs> Who wanted cheap wire hangers? Nobody wanted cheap wire hangers. And I held them up and I said, these were dads. <laughs> and when I said, I don't know, it's because she was there, right? When I said, these were dads, all of the pastors, I want one, I want one, I want one, I want one. And, 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 and intrinsically, uh, cheap, cheap wire hangers, but they used to belong to dad. So they were valuable. So what makes something precious? Often it's the association. Uh, I was looking, I was so surprised, uh, uh, and I was laughing because... Uh, I don't even know. I'm so sorry. I've told you I'm a dinosaur, right? So I read something about Justin Bieber. I do know who he is, okay? And I know what he looks like. But I confess, I do not know a single song by Justin Bieber. Not even one. Not even one. I do know that those who follow him are called believers, apparently, right? When Justin Bieber was much younger, he, you know, his hair is all, he had beautiful hair, right? Oh, this way and that way. And then when he was getting really, really famous, he shaved his head, and then he took a lock of his hair, 
and he sold it online. A lock of his hair, about this big, just a little or whatever. Guess how much the auction was for just a little piece of Justin Bieber's hair? Guess la. Forty-three thousand U.S. dollars. Forty-three thousand. Who has that kind of money for a? And the hair was probably greasy. I don't know. <laughs> Who knows? Forty-three thousand. Why was it precious to someone? Because of the association, right? It belonged to this person. Because of the association. So as we look at this, my question is. Why is Jesus precious, right? I think that's a logical question. Why is Jesus called precious? So let me ask you a question. Who are the things, who are the people, I shouldn't say things, who are the people that are precious to you? Usually. It's relationship, right? Joshua, who is most precious to you? He, he, he. Trick question. <laughs> so, so, Josh, your mom is here, your dad isn't. So who are you going to say? <laughs> dad is sick this morning. Usually, the people who are most precious to us are those that we are connected to, right? With whom we have a relationship. So I want to ask you something this morning as we look at this. Why does God call Jesus a precious stone, a precious cornerstone? The first reason he calls Jesus a precious stone is because Jesus is his son, right? Jesus is his son because of relationship. Now, this is going to make more, this is going to be significant for you and for me in just a minute. But what other, so it, it's based on relationship. So he's precious. Um, and God looks at him and he says, I lay in Zion a chosen and precious cornerstone. To you who believe, this stone is precious. So first of all, what makes Jesus the stone precious is because, of, is because of the relationship. This is his son. But why else is this stone precious? Let's just look at a few things very, very quickly this morning. Uh, we're, we're actually coming near the end of it. This is sort of the beginning of it, okay? But what does it say? Um, as we look at this, let me back up again a little bit. Let me back up here. Okay, so we're looking at two, four through seven. What are the things that make this stone precious? What makes this stone unique? Look at the passage and then we'll tell us. What's the first thing that we see? What's the first thing that we see? What makes this stone, Jesus, precious? He's living. He's living. He was dead and he rose from the dead. Now he's a living stone. This morning... Our beloved Pastor Fayez from Pakistan, as many of you heard, went to be with the Lord on Wednesday, th Thursday, I think, Thursday or Friday of this week. Some of us remember him well. They would always sit, usually over on this side with their kids. Um, J uh, Josh was part, of the, was part of the youth group, right? The other, another Josh, uh, the other was in, was in the Sunday school, and then at the end they had a child. This morning, Pastor Fayez is not dead. Pastor Fayez is not in a grave. Those of you who have loved ones in the Lord who are gone from this earth are not dead. Why are they not dead? Your mom, your mom, your dad. Because of the living stone who was dead and is now alive. And because he is the living stone, he brings life. And there's only one. There's only one who can do that. And therefore, he is precious. He is precious. Why else is he precious? He is chosen by God. That's another thing that makes this living stone precious, chosen by God. That's mentioned, that's mentioned twice. It says a chosen and precious cornerstone. It's mentioned twice. He is chosen. Why was he chosen? 
If you read in Revelation 13, 8, the lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world. He was chosen from the beginning. From the beginning. Why? Because in the beginning, God knew there would have to be someone who could save you. There would have to be someone who could bring you from death to life. There would have to be someone who could die and defeat death and rise again. There would have to be someone who could go through the testing that we all go through, that, go through the, that would go through the suffering that we all go through, that would go through the temptations that we all go through and would never have bitterness in his heart, would never have anger and unforgiveness against people, but would go through everything that we go, that we go through, that would experience everything we would experience and would be victorious in every situation, in every moment, in every time. So God had to choose carefully, and he did. And he chose his only son, his only begotten son, for you and for me. And so the stone is precious because he's chosen by God. He's chosen by God. He was rejected by men. This is mentioned twice also. God chooses and honors this, but it's rejected by the whole world. It's about valuation, isn't it? The world doesn't think that Jesus is very precious. The world doesn't think Jesus is very valuable. And Peter says, to you who believe, the stone is precious. But for the unbelieving, the stone that the builders rejected, the one, this one has become the cornerstone. This one has become the cornerstone. And then here's the other part. He has become the cornerstone. Now, you can take it either way. Because he is precious, he has become the cornerstone. Or you can say, because he is the storm, cornerstone, he is precious. It doesn't matter whichever way you take it. Take it one way, take it the other way, take it both ways. Take it either way. It's not a little stone plaque set in the wall after the building has been completed. But Jesus, the cornerstone, is precious because he is the cornerstone, because he is the foundation stone. He was the first stone to be laid in the temple of God that would be the church of God, that would have to endure the gates of hell and the onslaught of hell. And so the foundation stone, the cornerstone, would have to be strong. The foundation stone, the cornerstone, would have to be perfect. The, the foundation stone, the cornerstone, would have to be completely straight, completely reliable, completely trusted. Why? Because everything, everything, everything that God does in your life in my life, in the church, in the world, must be built on the cornerstone, must line up with the cornerstone. He is the cornerstone of the church. He's the cornerstone of your life. Is your life built on the cornerstone? Does your life line up with the cornerstone? Is your life set on the cornerstone? How do you fit with the cornerstone? Or is Jesus just a little plaque? that you put on the side on Sunday morning? Is he that or is he the cornerstone of your life? Because if he is the cornerstone of your life, this is what, this is what uh, Peter quoted. I love this from Isaiah 28, 16. Look at it. This is the original passage. Look at it with me. Therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Look, pay attention. I'm placing a foundation stone in Jerusalem a firm and tested stone. It is a precious cornerstone that is safe to build on. Whoever believes need never be shaken. This is your Jesus. This is your chosen stone. This is your cornerstone. This is your precious stone. This is your living stone. You can trust your life to him. You can trust your life with him. You can trust your future, your finances, your family with him. He's trusted. He's proven. Build your life on Jesus. No wonder he is the precious stone. No wonder he's the precious stone. Now I told you, oh, 
and we've got to stop. I'm going to stop with this. I told you, why do you think Peter got this writing assignment? Why do you think he did? I think he got this writing assignment because Jesus said, you're going to be called stone. That's what you're going to be. Was Peter a stone when Jesus called him that? Nope. Peter was shaking, sinking sand for much of his early life, even when he walked with Jesus. But as he built his life on the foundation stone, on the cornerstone, on the living stone, he became a rock. He became a rock. Peter and John, we're going to close with this. Peter and John walking into the temple. Jesus had gone back to heaven. Walking into the temple one day. And there's the lame man. Remember that? Remember the lame man? They're walking in. So here's Peter talking about precious things. 30 years earlier, he sees this lame man. And what does he say to him? Do you remember what he says to him? He says, he says, hey, look at us. I'm, I'm getting something. I'm getting 3,000 pesos. <laughs> I'm getting 10 pounds. <laughs> I'm getting 2,600 Hong Kong dollars. And Peter says, I don't have silver or gold. Are silver and gold precious in this world's commodities? Yes. But to God, nothing. So easy. And Peter says, I don't have silver or gold, but let me tell you what I do have. I have Jesus, the living stone, the chosen stone, the precious stone, the cornerstone. And he says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, what does he say? Get up and walk. And instantly the man is healed. Instantly the man is healed. And he walks and leaps, praising God in the temple. Oh, the Sanhedrin and the Jewish leaders, they get all bent out of shape. Uh, I told you, now why did Peter get this writing assignment? They arrest Peter and John, bring them and say, what are you doing? And by whose name? What's going on? Look at Peter's words. Ready? Oh, I, I love how this fits with 1 Peter. You may not even have noticed this before. Acts 4, 9 and 10. He says, do you want to know how he was healed? You want to know how he was healed? Let me clearly state to all of you and to all the people of Israel that he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the man you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. Here you go now. Ready for the key verse? Look, verses 11 and 12. For Jesus is the one referred to in the scriptures where it says, the stone you builders rejected has now become what? The cornerstone. Why is he precious? There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. No wonder he's precious. There's only one of him. There's only one who can save. There's only one who can heal. There's only one on whom you can build and your life will withstand the storms of life. There's only one when you are shaken, when you fall, when you fail, who comes to you and picks you up and says, build your life on me. Keep going. I know you are this now, but you will be this. You're shifting sand right now, but you'll be a rock. You'll be a stone. You're this right now, but you will be this because your life is lined up with me. No wonder, no wonder we come to the living stone, the chosen stone, the cornerstone, the precious stone, and our lives will make it. You'll make it. You'll make it. Do you feel like you won't make it this morning? You'll make it. You'll make it. Line up your life with Jesus. Build your life on Jesus. I, I say this to every single person here. I say this to the... I know I pick on you two over here. You, you, it's because you're the youngest ones here. So that's, I, got to include, I got to include those two. And then I look over here. I think the oldest ones are over, sorry, over this way. Those of us who have gone a long way with God, we have found that Jesus is faithful. Those of you who have gone a shorter time with Jesus, Jesus is faithful. 
Are you going to fail? Yes. Are you going to fall? Yes. Are you going to blow it? Yes. Are you going to deny him? You may. But Jesus says, I see what you will be. I see what you can be. Build your life on me. So we've begun this morning. I'm stopping. We'll catch up. We'll pick up again next week. It's definitely time to stop now. I'm going to pray for you this morning. You can make it. Jesus, your precious stone. Your precious stone. Jesus, we are so grateful. Lord, Holy Spirit, um, we don't mean this in a demeaning way, but you're so smart. (laughs) You gave Peter this writing assignment. And and now we understand why. And it means so much to us. And it helps us too when we see ourselves and we think I'm this and I'm that. But you see us in a different way. Lord, we pray for ourselves and we pray for one another. May our lives be lined up with you. And Lord, where, where our lives have been built on other things, things other than the living, precious, chosen cornerstone of Jesus, Uh, We remake those things and we redo those things and we line up again with you. And Jesus, where we don't fit with you and your perfection and your squareness and you're absolutely straight, Lord, work on us. Work on us until we do, until we do line up with you. We thank you, Jesus, for being our precious cornerstone, chosen living. And because you live, we too shall live. In the name of Jesus, we pray together. Amen. 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 Can I give you a reading assignment? Read 1 Peter 1 and 2. 1 Peter 1 and 2. You sure did shut me down quickly, Michelle. I was hoping to keep that picture up there just a little bit longer. Thank you. That just encourages us as we close. God bless you. Have a great week. Amen.